Hello, welcome to another Tonalist Landscape oil painting demonstration with your painter in residence, M. Francis McCarthy, and welcome as well to day 23 of the Past Masters series, volume 2. Today I'm bringing you a study after Ralph Albert Blakelock called Moonlight. I don't know what size this painting was. Mine is an eight by eight. And heck, I'm not even sure if his was actually a square. I might have just decided to make a square because he worked in this like sort of mm, squarish format that might have been something like, I don't know, maybe an inch wider than it was tall or something like that. I don't know. Like a little more squat than an eight by 10. Either way, I worked with this image as a square. This is my first Blake Lock study. Um, I like Blake Lock's work. I haven't done a lot of studies after his work because I don't like all of it. I don't even like most of it, but he was big. He was very popular back in the day. And uh, I, po I pulled up a little short bio on Artsy we could go to Wikipedia as well, but I like to change things up. I'll read that to you now. Uh, with the exception of James Abbott McNeil Whistler and Albert Pinkham Ryder, no American tonalist was more crucial to the development of American modernism than Ralph Albert Blakelock. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I even care about that sort of um, angle, but whatever. Although he started out as a somewhat conventional Hudson River School painter, his poetic and symbolic moonlights of the 1890s with their emphasis on pattern and abstract design and manipulated paint services changed, changed the face of American art. Blakelock's scintillating dreamlike nocturnes re reward close inspection for their interplay of color tone, subtle vibration, refracted edges, jagged rhythmic patterns and dissonant harmonies this writer is getting i know i know i believe this is the same writer as the um history of america american tonalism i believe this is written written by david a cleveland because he writes in a very poetic style it's very good but uh, he also likes to um this writer anyway likes to tie tonalism to modernism because um I my and my feeling is that he does this because modernism is you know what's taken over and uh, to try and get some attention to this awesome period of art which was very modern and very different for its time. It's but he's not he's not wrong in tying it to modernism. However, yeah, I don't care. How about that? I don't really like most modern art and. Um, I won't go in a rant. I'll spare you. If you want to hear some of my rants, though, you know, there's a few videos I put up. There's quite a few I recorded and then deleted because <laughs> I know no one wants to hear someone get negative. So we'll, we'll just keep moving on. Um, anyway, there's you can go to Artsy. You can just type Ralph Albert Blakelock into a search engine. I got a little very interesting little book. Uh, last time I was on holiday, um, very thin little book and uh, one of the uh, it covered three tonalist artists. Uh, the only one I'm recalling right now is Ralph Albert Blakelock. But uh, Blakelock had a whole backstory that he was mad and actually he lived um, for quite a while in an institution. He had a a woman who was an agent that actually was manipulating his uh, the market for his work. If not he, uh, as he himself. Uh, he certainly was selling his work. She certainly was selling his work for quite a lot more money than he was aware, and um, and basically making a good profit. But at the same time, sort of promulgating this story about how mad he was, and you know, it was just there was a, a narrative, and that's one thing I've definitely noticed with the sale and popularity of artworks is that um, people like a narrative. You know, they like. They like a story, like with Van Gogh, it's the the guy was in love with this uh, barmaid or whatever and cut off his ear. You know, everyone knows that. Everyone knows that story. I mean, when people bring up that kind of thing to me, I was like, yeah, well, what about his art? That's what I'm interested in. And, you know, I like 
speaking of Blakelock's art, I like uh, his approach. He has um, his strongest stuff is like this silhouetted stuff. He called the work called Moonscapes or what have you. I'm looking at some work on Artsy um, that really is just not that appealing. It isn't Moonscapes. It's just I don't know a lot of reds and I just. I don't love it. I really like his stuff where he goes off into yellow or pinks or whatever. Um, but, you know, I'm going to have to... There's a few I see that I would like to make studies after. Maybe one. <laughs> one is very similar to this one. So, actually, if you don't mind while I'm here, I will go ahead and copy that to my folder. So, speaking of studies after the Masters, wow. I only have one more uh, that's done, and uh, that is a Camille Corot study, which we'll get into next week. And um, unless something very interesting happens soon, I will be um, uh, will be uh, working without past masters for a little while. So something to, to, to watch out for. Let me just save this image. You'll be glad I did. Sorry for the interruption. Whoa, you're not even letting me save the image. Curse you, Artsy, curse you. All right, well, it's not meant to be. Maybe one day. Um, I just gotta think about it. I actually have like another 25, maybe not that many, maybe it's only 20. Um, boards set up, images selected, so I'll be getting back into the past masters and I wasn't quite, it's kind of caught me a little unawares. I think I have one or two in the studio that just need a quick second pass. So maybe I'll, actually I gotta go back to work today, maybe I'll do that instead of what I was thinking of doing. Um, just so we, uh, cause I, you know, I like to keep, be consistent. I actually like having the past master every week. I think it breaks things up from just a steady stream of um, M. Francis McCarthy paintings. But, uh, and I also like the two a week schedule. We'll see if I can keep up with it. Sometimes my output isn't, uh, um, well, uh, isn't that great. So it's it definitely easier with the smaller paintings, but as I move into the bigger works, um, well, we'll see. Who can tell what the future holds, my friend? Anyway, um, so there we are, Rolf Albert Blakelock. Hopefully you enjoyed that. If you're interested in this guy, look him up. Uh, go to Wikipedia. Just type his name into Google and you'll, you'll definitely get some stuff. Um, I was going to, uh, well, I'm with a bit of a crossroads in, the, in my, my, my practice at the studio right now. I've like... Well, first of all, I've just finished doing a restoration job on a painting, a hundred, hundred year old painting that had been pretty badly knocked up. And I don't know, someone tried, someone tried to touch it up with a felt pen. It's so sad because it's a beautiful old painting. And uh, um, a lot of people, you know, I know that I do this kind of older style. And uh, although to be honest, when you look at what I do, um, I kind of get the, the quality of the old stuff but in a sort of modern way modern approach I could point out all sorts of differences between the way I work and these old guys worked so um, and I, you know getting up and close and personal with this painting I did some restoration on you know it's pretty apparent um, I mean I could certainly make a copy after what whatever was done uh, and I could even do stroke for stroke if I had to but yeah, who wants to do that? That sounds hecka boring to me. So uh, that took a day uh, fixing up this painting. And I uh, did another painting this week. Uh, but uh, I'm at a crossroads because I have like two or three that are sitting there with uh, one coat on them waiting for a second coat. But I kind of feel like doing new paintings, you know. Which means uh, that's probably what I'll end up doing. We'll see. I could either get in there and finish that old one, or actually, I just discovered uh, I'm running out of past masters, so uh, that might um, might be just the impetus I need. I have a 
a Corot study in the studio that needs a second pass. And um, ooh, uh, I'm trying to remember the other artists sitting there too, but it, that just needs a little more work as well. That would give me two more, yeah. Which would keep you guys going, man. We don't want you jonesing. Yeah. Um, what else would I like to talk about? Let's see. Um, uh, we've been doing uh, some teaching of oil painting, like I said, and um, oh, I know. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about edges. So, if you're hungry for information, you'll be glad you you stuck with me ten minutes in here. So we're doing this. Um, my student and I during this um, figure of woman that has like a seashell. She's coming out of a seashell and uh, it's going to be pretty detailed when we're all said and done, but we're doing a block in and uh, we are working on a textured board that's been tinted uh, kind of a grayish tone and uh, we've transferred our drawing using charcoal and uh, cleaned up the drawing and uh, painted in the shell and we're working with the figure and one of the things that I was um, sort of stressing was that you know, with oil paint, you could just keep adding layer after layer after layer, especially if you want to go for extreme detail. This is a, a lot of the, the best ways to get detail is to let something dry. You know, paint it as fairly large shapes, let it dry and then paint smaller shapes over the top. That's the age old technique. There's other strategies like you could work in grayscale and then come in and glaze in your color. That's another good way to get the detail. Um, but what we're doing is, is, you know, just filling things in. So we're working wet. We did a background, filled in the whole entire background was blue. And it was very, uh, various different shades of blue. And uh, now we're into the figure. And one of the things I really wanted to stress uh, with my student was that you have to, you have to pay very good attention to your quality of your edges because if they're too sharp you get like this cut out effect like everything was cut out with a pair of scissors and that is extremely hard to get rid of in successive painting sessions so it's really important like you could modulate the color 12 ways to Sunday you could tint things you can add values you do all sorts of things, but really important in the early stages of, a, of your early of your oil painting to get the edges. And by edges, I mean the areas where one color um, overlaps another and to define a shape or form. So in this case, we're doing the human form over a blue background and. Uh, one technique I'll do is instead of running my brush along the edge, I will come at, I will come at, come at it running across. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, so instead of moving, say you're doing an arm, and instead of moving your brush like you would up and down the arm, I'll move it across, uh, using the little hairs in the edge of the brush to kind of subtly break up those edges that way. That's a good technique. Or if you are running along, you can have your brush sort of dry uh, when you're doing the edges so that it's just kind of doing a streaky sort of thing. That's not a bad approach. Um, one of the worst approaches would be to just lay in one solid color by another solid color and then just fan them together. That looks so amateurish. So anyway we're getting kind of close to the end here i just thought i'd talk a little bit about edges i've talked about edges before and edges is just one of the many things that you've got to master in, a, in any oil painting and um it's not such a challenge with most of the things that i do because i'm working with fractured brush strokes against fractured brush strokes i'm doing everything generally and my first color pass is all done at one time and I'm not into doing excessive amounts of detail or anything like that. If I was going to do excessive detail, I would do still take the same approach to my first color pass um, and wait for that to dry and then just add layers of detail on top of that. But I always pay special attention to edge, edges and edge quality 
in that first color pass because like I said if you don't uh, you'll regret it It'd be very hard for you to just install nice edges if they're not present um, so anyway thanks for watching today I really appreciate it appreciate all your new subscribers joining the channel uh, if you like the video uh, give it a like that tells YouTube that uh, you like the video and, uh, and maybe they'll send more people this way and they can listen to me ramble about painting and life in the studio and all that other good stuff um, feel free to leave a comment go to my website if you go to my website uh, if you join my mailing list you'll get something at some point you do get something when you join it's a, um, a high-res image that's what you get also access I think to some content that's not on YouTube but uh, I plan on rolling something out special for the mailing list people soon. So meanwhile, please take good care and stay.